Oh, yeah, there. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the invitation to be here. And it's been a great honor and also a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, especially the Nello Cultural Art Program who extended the invitation to us. And um, actually the invitation was extended to me. And as always, I try to include not just myself, but people who I've been uh, mentoring. And so I brought with me my three apprentices who are no longer apprentices. Um, they are their own masters and they have learned much from a lot of the things that I, I have learned also from um, my grandparents and also my, my mom who was the um, sole provider for me, for us. And so I would like to bring Ephraim up here. He can do his little introduction and just kind of explain or talk a little bit about his experience today and maybe a little bit about your apprenticeship and some of the things that you have learned um, that's related to the horse implements, maybe the tools. <laughs> and I know you're good at the technical <coughs> aspect of things. So maybe you can um, show us an example of that. And then after that, we'll have Kevin ask us, and then we'll end with Alessio, and then that's when I'll come back up here and share with you my PowerPoint presentations. So Ephraim, up <laughs> Hello, like Roy introduced, um, trying to do this quick try not to take a lot of time. Uh, it's my apprenticeship and everything. I do a lot of history making. I mean, I read a lot of history making from our ancestors to all of that, so um, I joined with Roy about many, many moons ago, about a year. Um, I've been with the uh, apprentice, Alicio, Kevin, Roy, learning about, at first it was just about the weaving, but then you get so much into your own culture that your life intersects history and culture and spirituality and a lot of things happen and I feel very honored to be part of the apprenticeship and what we've done um, some of the stuff I've done like this one is about an 18th century winter blanket later on people can touch it don't take it home if I put it on you um, I'm not gifting it, I'll take it back. Um, <laughs> it's just so people can uh, to try it, just to see uh, how much our history we don't know and how much our ancestors knew um, in terms of their lives. How many have seen something like this? You saw it being created. <laughs> It's a mixture of different styles, some of the earliest um, patterns. Uh, anthropologists would say definable Navajo culture, but the further you go back, the further all the tribes, even the Anasazi just seem to be in this giant glob of interaction. So this one has different patterns dating the last 1500 years. And the more you research it, the more that you understand some of these patterns. It's really interesting. So we're going to go, why I, I mentioned Anasazi and all of that, and why I'm dressed the way I am. Um, this would have been your riding outfit for a Navajo man near Gallup around 1890. So it's really interesting all the different styles that our culture has 
adapted to. And one of the big things about the horse implements and weaving is twill. And it's really interesting when you go into the history of twill because people say, well, sheep are only from the 1600s, there's nothing before that. But there is, at least in this area, right here, cotton, dating to about as early as 16, no, 600 AD, some would argue 800 AD. So when you go that far back, it's cotton. And a lot about cotton, you don't think winter. So what did they do to make cotton insulating? Well, they did twill. This one shows you the progression from the way they wove to an indigenous tribe in South America to a broken Navajo diamond twill. This one isn't twill, but the property is wool. We made a shortcut. We could get thick blankets quick with wool with time. So that's all these little weavings here. And this one's a recreation of the twill. Even down to like <coughs> the way horse cinches are woven, there's weaving fragments and textiles that still have this style about 1,500 years ago except that Navajos are still weaving in the same style. So it's how interconnected all our weavings are. And I'm really happy that Roy is given this opportunity because we go to museums, we see a lot of work, and a lot of it isn't out there. It's just on shelves. So it's a lot of stuff that, I'm not saying we're the experts, but we're becoming the experts in, in all this stuff, and even with the felting. So I was going to bring moccasins, the, the pants, how the wrap kilt became uh, trousers, but in lieu of time, I'll give it to Kevin now. I'm from Shiprock. I'm one of Roy Cady's apprentices. <coughs> um, I started apprenticing with Roy about see a year and a half ago now. Um, but before then, I had been weaving just sash belts, but like when when I was ten. So, but the school sports took over, caught my attention more. But now, for about a year now, well, since I've been apprenticing with Roy. <coughs> Um, I've gotten more serious about my work uh, as, a, as a weaver and an artist. Um, and just joining Roy, Licio, and Zephyrin um, has opened a lot of doors and has uh, taught me a lot of stuff I wouldn't have um, learned about in school. That's the language, the culture, and uh, the history from a anthropologist of uh, you. So, um, as, a, as a weaver and artist, a lot of my work is uh, kind of not based in the trading post style weaving, so not like Tuber Hills or the Ganada, none of the regional styles. I, I'm more interested in what we consider utilitarian, but it's also, you know, you can also, it's also put on the wall, it's considered art. Um, so I deal with more like the blankets, the cheap blankets, uh, the mantas, um, some rug dresses here and there, but um, now that I'm learning more about it, it's also, Roy has also been telling us and teaching us, you know, you don't just have to restrict yourself to this one main area of Navajo weaving, you can branch out and go to different, um, Pictorial. He's introduced to us European uh, techniques to incorporate into our weavings. So um, that's kind of the route that I seem to be taking more now. So I'm um, expanding my view of art in terms of textiles. So that's what I'm doing right now. And mm -hmm. yeah. you, you want to show us some of your. Oh, the only one I brought was um was this little 
um, synth or synth at a uh, twill or synth. So yeah, how long have you been? <laughs> I've been working on this for about two weeks. <laughs> yeah. When did um, you start? <laughs> well, I've worked on it for two weeks, but it's been on here. It's been up for about a year now. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting name, maybe you should share. Oh, this is the called. Two names. <coughs> oh, first name. The whole first name is on. There's one you get this, it's called Imas. E -e -mas. And then E -e -mas do Ashni. Right? Ashni. So, um, yeah, those are the names, the best names for it. Um, I put this, the symbol right here is uh, supposed to represent the sun. But a lot of people have made comments saying it looks like Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> but it's supposed to be the sun. So, yeah. Yeah. I see it. All right, this is your turn. I'm Yatta. She a Alicia Curly and she no God in there, no Schnee, not God in there. I just seen. The Tahni Dasha Chedi Plasha Yashnali. And I've been apprenticing Roy longer than the others. I don't know, years? Three? Four years? Four years? Yeah. And I've been learning all different kinds of um, weaving styles, weaving techniques. Um, not just weaving, but other arts and other um, like cooking or going out and picking the uh, plant and using that plant and something. And so most of the weavings I've done were mainly on um, sash belt. I set up the sash belt loom here for the museum and um, also started um, teaching how to um, weave horsinches. Yeah. And so by the main ones I did were, are over here. So this was my very first one when Roy started teaching me how to weave the, the horse inches and then the second one and then started going on and then finally today I finished this one out of, I think it's been on the loom for like a year and a half. I've been taking it to all these um, presentations and then trying to weave it. So finally finished it today. Is it for yeah. sale? Can be for sale. Oh. <laughs> anybody wants to use it and so here's another one I'm working on so hopefully get this one done I don't know when <laughs> next year next year maybe <laughs> but yeah so I've just been that's what I've been doing um learning all the different techniques um the Navajo names and stuff I go with some of the weavings um yeah I'm just going around throughout the whole community different communities and teaching younger people in the schools and in, at the chapter houses. So, and I'll be teaching a Sashpa weaving class during the summer courses at Dinah College in Shibra. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, the only saddle blanket I brought is this one down here. This one was woven by my one of my Nolly ladies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think maybe back in like the 40s or 50s, somewhere back then. But it was given to me by one of my aunts. And I also have some other other weavings as well. And I'll turn it over to Rowley Katie. Mr. Ross. <laughs> Those are my apprentices, um, former apprentices. But uh, interestingly, just to kind of mention briefly that um, when the apprenticeship started, I just kind of posted on Facebook, the social media that everybody's on. And I said, OK, who would like to apprentice with me? I'll be looking for some of the youth in the areas that might dedicate themselves and learning some of the things that have been passed on to me. So that's how this whole apprenticeship started with them. Currently, I'm doing adults. I have four more apprentices that came um, yesterday that I met with. And it's an all free 
it's all about you and your dedication. So I have four adults that I'll be working with within the next year or so and teaching them as well. Um, I wanted to start with the youth because I really felt that it was important that I pass that on um, because I also felt that it wasn't um, done enough even though there was um, other people or other families who were doing so. Um, but I felt like I had a, a lot of knowledge and uh, instilled in me by so many people, not just my grandparents or, or my mom, but um, there were other artists in the area of the community who I also um, work with in, in learning their techniques and then passing that on to them so that to make sure that it continues. And so that's how the apprenticeship started. And also, interestingly, we learn from each other. There are some things that they come forth because most of them, um, all of them come from uh, uh, weavers with a background with their own families. And so they bring forth things that I only heard about. And I get to see them and some of the tools that they have that, that belong to their grandparents that would come forth. Like there's an example with Ephraim. He has the tools that have the tip that are blackened with um, charcoal. And maybe he can later explain that to you, but um, that's so that you can see the tip of the, the baton going through your strings. Because sometimes you have that um, vision issue with the, you know, the contrast, of, especially when you work with just um, white work. So things like that. Um, I'm going to start my presentation. It's titled Paint But Not Yet. And what that means is um, implements. Implements of the horse. It, it, it has been told to us that uh, mainly the men, but there also have been some um, women who were horsewomen, which included my mom. She was the only one that, that raised us, so she had to teach us both um, everything that you do outside and also inside. And that's how we learned everything from weaving to cooking to herding sheep. And then at the time, earlier on when we had horses still, we were able to learn some of the horsemanship. And that's where some of the, um, the knowledge and the, and the gift of um, horse weaving came forth to me was from my grandfather. So um, I see in the area of like over in here, um, in Sahakes, that there are some horse implements that are on display. I think that's probably braided with um, horse hair. So that was also done. So um, that whatever material was available was used, whether it was cotton or wool at a later time. Um, and so we'll start the presentation. So so Ado is it that plan for Yere Adeco Ishten? Is not mass. A he see bear with you, the shadow art or old cut the nature. Aja ya he cashed in the dark where she has lay, she ya ho at the da ado ya it and the dark where cashed it. Ado a he see shinanish in Senege the bed, the nanish stone the da. Um, dig it out the the bed that's ado. あ、あ、デスドーダイスオンイトロギエーシナンシンセンアブラカニカチコシェイカツファイバーアーティストオンダイヤイベディンチュオンダイシナンシンセンデシノハシネチェアドンデタアシマサンアドンデタシチョトデ
um, techniques from other people, from other sources, from other artists within the area. And so I was kind of, in that way, I feel privileged and I also was honored to carry that on forth to them. Because a lot of them, they expressed to me at the time that nobody was interested, that everybody had moved on um, to get an education, which is also just as great, um, and also who have not shown interest in coming back and learning them. So I was happy to accept them as gifts, and so as a gift, you know, it's something that you pass on. It doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to no one. It's a gift that gets passed on, so that's how I treat it. And, that, and that's what I do continually. So I learned at about nine years old. Uh, I did my first weaving when I was at that age. I remember earlier on sitting at my mother's loom, and sometimes I would do little sections of her weavings. And then <coughs> she knew, you know, when I wove, and she would kind of scold me, not harshly, but just kind of scold me, and said that, you know, I would make a mistake for her. But at times I would leave a section and then I would pull them out and I, I acted like I didn't do anything. So that's how I learned mainly. And then finally when she thought that I was ready to pursue it, uh, is when she came out and brought out all of the materials that were needed to, to set up a loom. And that's when I remember setting up a loom. Uh, I didn't bring that piece, but it's unfinished. Uh, I still would like to finish it one of these days. Uh, I don't know how successful I would be to matching some of the really bright colors that I chose in that piece, um, but I could come close because now I've learned a lot about different dye techniques, uh, even if it's um, commercial dyes or vegetal dyes. My voice is a little hoarse, so bear with me. <clears throat> um, I weave traditional patterns, just like Kevin talked about, some of the utilitarian patterns which um, a lot of them surprisingly are just stripes. Um, but they all carry a story, they all the, the symbolism in, in creating uh, a chief blanket, uh, uh, have meanings to it. They represent rainbows. They represent um, di different cloud elements, different elements of, of the universe. And those are part of the, the, the designs that you see in the earlier weavings. And you kind of continue to see that in. In the, in the newer forms as well. Um, so uh, I do other fiber arts as well. I do felting. I do different kinds of felting. There's the wet felting, and then there's the dry felting, um, sculptural felting, uh, and so forth. And then I also have um, learned many other um, fiber arts uh, weaving, whether it's European. Um, I learned, um, I took a, a course one, one, one week I was offered a course to learn from the French weavers, they were tapestry weavers, and I said, why not? And that's what um, opened a lot of um, uh, my mind towards other kinds of uh, techniques that can be used, not just the, the techniques that we know in, in our weaving, but to also incorporate that. And so I do much of that this, um, in this time of my life. So. <coughs> Um, very important figures in, in my family. Um, important because the one up in the corner, that's my late uncle, George Cady. Um, they were horsemen. Um, I've heard stories about my grandfather who was in this corner. Um, his name was Cady Ghana Begay. In Navajo, it was um, Cady Ghana And then um, the two of them, they were the last two to keep the horse. Um, traditions in our family. So once they have passed and once they have gone, um, that's when our horse tradition um, ended and ceased because I think my mom was also the last person to have a horse. She used to still tra transport us to the store on horseback. And I didn't get to find that picture, but I do have pictures of her and some of us kids propped in the back of her and she would take us to the store and back. So this is where a lot of the, the teachings of the horse in Pemish, um, Kate and it comes from, is from my grandfather. Um, she want, he once showed me how to do an everyday cinch. And what he did was he, he skirted the ends and then he just simply lapsed and on his lap 
he didn't need a, a lap spindle like we do. And then he just um, plied it, and then he strung them up the two, between the two um, cinch rings, and then off he went riding his horse. And then um, my grandmother always used to tell me that that's how um, he always liked to, to make his cinches, is doing, um, you know, around shearing time. And then if you think about it, because wool felt, so the more you, you work it with moisture and friction, and when you're riding on the horse, it just even strengthens it even more. Um, and so, and then weaving the horse cinches is what my grandmother did as well. And he all, she also wove a lot of his saddle blankets. So these two is where um, earlier on, it was very early. I mean, I might have been um, around eight or 10 years old, maybe around 12 years old when I last saw a horse. But I remember our neighbors still having horses, and we used to go over there and, and you know, saddle them up and still ride around until they got rid of their horse. So one of the things, go ahead. Um, some of the implements that I, I know how to how to how to uh, make are the horse blankets, um, horse blankets versus saddle blankets. Earlier on, before we acquired a saddle from the Spaniards, they used to just be horse blankets. So we would just weave horse blankets that we would prop on our horses and ride them that way without the saddle. And then the saddle came to us, then we started weaving saddle blankets. That's how um, it's been told to me. Um, I also know how to do the woven cinch and then the strung cinch which uh, I don't think we have an example with us today. Um, one of my apprentices promised me that he would make one, but I think he got really busy, as they all do. Um, <clears throat> and just explaining to you again, the horse saddle and the saddle blanket, the difference between the two. And then also the braided ropes. Um, here's an example of a braided rope. Um, if you want to go past this around and just kind of See, and then later you can all come up here and see some of the, the examples that we have here. So these were important implements to a lot of the Navajos, especially the men, because they're the ones that went out and uh, maybe acquired a new wild horse to tame, or even their own offspring of horses to tame. And so having a very strong rope made out of wool, braided in this fashion, worked. And it's something that... Um, was very common before um, the trading post era started in the 1930s. So these were some of the things that you would saw in the homesteads and the hogans of, of, of our uh, grandparents. And then um, one of the things that I also um, have learned to do is to weave the, a bridle, um, all the straps in the bridle, and then I um, buy all the buckles and then I, I fix them together um, and then later on I'll show you an example of one of them. Um, I'm going to share with you a horse cinch. Um, back in 2004, um, as a fiber artist I go through uh, many um, evolution, you might call it. Uh, I study or I get inspired by something. In this case, around the 2000, I was really inspired about hearing the stories about you know what I'm sharing with you, about the horse implements, <coughs> about my grandfather owning over 100 head of horses, and how he was able to, with my uncle George, how they were able to tame all those horses and to make them into work horses, where some of them plowed the fields some of them were just mainly to use to go up the mountain because they were they were more aggressive that way. They were stronger. Uh, is, is the word that I used to say. You know, that kind of a horse. And not all horses are the same. There's some that are just around, you know, in, in the lower valleys where it's uh, more of a straightaway. Um, in this case, some of the horses that they tame were wild horses that they that they caught from the mountains, who you know migrate throughout the, the different um, geological formations, which made them um, um, you know 
versatile in, in those areas. And so, um, so around in 2004, I did a, my first cinch, my first cinch to enter into the, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, uh, uh, not Museum, sorry, into the Santa Fe Indian Market. And I remember I, I got there and, and that's just one of the pieces. I had a, a woven piece and I also had a cinch. And I, I entered them in two different categories. And I remember as I, I was entering them, um, the people who were receiving the entries, it took them a while to categorize it because they didn't have a category for it. And it was the first time they'd ever received such an entry. And so they had to kind of have to just place me in, in one of the woven categories. And surprisingly, I received a third place for them. And that kind of also gave me um, the notion that, yeah, it is still important. It's still important that it needed to be carried on and it needed to be woven again. And that one I titled the Milky Way. Um, and then later it became uh, a set, which you'll see later, um, a, um, titled the Northern Lights. So here we see a picture of the Milky Way. Um, if you're familiar with some of the horse stories in, in, the, in our culture, as how the city <coughs> pulls down uh, the saddle, and also sometimes you'll see it in the middle of your saddle blankets where there are stripe patterns or there are uh, zigzag patterns that take place. And that's where uh, it, it represents the center of the universe. As, as when you fold out the, the saddle blanket, you know, in the center is where the Milky Way is. And that also is associated and affiliated with the, the horse creation stories and, and also the horse songs. In this case, I did uh, the, the two pairs, which was the uh, Milky Way um, woven cinch. And this particular diagonal wheel is a one three count. So that the back, as you can see there, um, you kind of see the more um, refined lines. And then the front, it's kind of more condensed and um, a little bit more or less refined. Um, the greatest example was that um, sample piece that you guys saw as the front, you guys said it kind of made you dizzy. Well, this is the, the technique of the one three count. <coughs> and then that's the, 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 the braided um, Libro that accompanied it. A cinch two that I did, <coughs> again in 2004, um, also was entered into the um, uh, a Santa Fe Indian market, and it still also received a uh, third place ribbon. And that one I titled Turquoise Sunray. And there's a picture of it. I couldn't hit it the other way, but you can see it sideways. Maybe you want to tilt your head this way. But some of the stories of the horse, of horses are really beautiful. If you've ever been to a Bajin, to the Blessing Way, and they um, sing uh, the horse songs, it's, it's very powerful and it's also very beautiful. So when I listen to the songs or when I listen to the creation stories, I also try to imagine as an artist what a turquoise sun ray would look. And so I bring that into my weaving form and then I weave it and I say, oh, well this is how it looks in physical form. And that's how some of my titles or some of my pieces are titled and how they some of them are also creative. And this one is a large diamond twill count. Um, the, force, the first horse gear set that I want to share with you is in a permanent collection at the Four Corners Medical Center in Red Mesa. If you ever go there, you go into the main um, lobby area. And they have these little um, displays. Um, you'll see it there. Um, they purchased it um, somewhere back in around 2007 or 2008 and it was newly being built and they were um, asking the community if they wanted to submit um, some of their uh, art to be in permanent collection there. Um, again, uh, I, I entered this as a set, my first set uh, in the um, 
the um, Herd Museum in the market that I also um, uh, exhibit at um, yearly. I try to do yearly, but some years I, I, I've, I've missed out on it. But in 2007, uh, I was also very honored to receive the honorable mention, you know, that it's also um, considered there because a lot of times in these marketplaces, um, it's difficult because you have a lot of entries. Um, the main entries that a lot of times that you kind of um, see that are the ribbon winners or the trading post style designs, um, which kind of um, dominate. But in this case, when I submitted this as a utilitarian type of uh, submission, uh, I was really happy to see that honorable mention. It just gave me a lot of good um, um, inspiration and also motivation to just keep doing it. And so this one was titled Black Clouds. It included the everyday strong cinch. It also included the, the, the woven saddle blanket. It also had a woven cinch. It had a braided bridle and a felted saddle pad, which they have never seen before. Um, and also a, a braided libro. And there's a, a picture of the, the blanket itself. And I think we might be going into Facebook here. I'm not sure. No, it's not. You're OK. Keep going. Here, you're, you're seeing me working on the floor, um, layering out all the carded wool and, and making the, the saddle pad. How many of you are, 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 are familiar with felting? Good. So felting happens with one certain <coughs> friction, and it's a layering process of wool that you layer after it's been carded. You open up the fibers. And in this case, it's going to be a wet felting. Go ahead, Kristen. So you wet the fabric or the fibers after that, and then you start the rolling process. Back and forth, back and forth, until everything interlocks. Do you want to get that out for me and show everybody um, what you guys did yesterday? Go ahead, Kristen. He's going to pass around an example of one. And this can be used. You can use both of them. But I'll talk about the other one later. And then here, some dance routines helps. You know, your powwow dance or your two-step dance, whatever it is, or you could be running in place. So in order to felt something thick, it takes a lot of upper body muscles or stomping on it. Go ahead. There I am weaving um, the center stripe, which represents the Milky Way. <coughs> Go ahead. And then there I am with finishing it. I also have a Yoda that I used to use um, in my um, signatures, but I don't use it no more. Um, uh, personal reasons. Um, here I am with my real red spindle, re-spinning um, some of the wool that I'm going to later ply to make my um, braided bridle. Here I am braiding the bridle in different sections. Go ahead. And then here's the set. So here you have the everyday cinch. There's the woven cinch. There's the lead rope. There's the bridle that's braided. And then there's the saddle blanket. And then just a little glimpse of the, the felted pad. Go ahead. Um, if you want to go there, we'll just go there really quick. Ooh, <gasps> doesn't like us. That's not them. Oh, you're very popular. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go down to and click there. And then enter full screen and the options. So just kind of another close-up of the set. Here's the braided bridles, and then <coughs> again the everyday cinch, and then the horse, um, the woven cinch. Go ahead. And there's the ribbon that it received. 
and we just keep going. And then the tassels, I remember these tassels, uh, my mom taught me how to make the tassels. It's my first time ever putting tassels, um, applying that to it. Kind of the same thing, so just kind of speed through it. In the everyday sense, you don't know which, which it is. I've never done this before. This all kind of was um, measurements and all that came from YouTube, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew how to braid it. I just kind of made everything up along the way. What kind of braiding do you use? I just used a four um, interlock braiding, which is makes it into a round tubular form. And then this um, twill, I think it's done. This particular twill is a diamond twill, but I'm only using two colors. Um, sometimes you can use just the two colors, or you can use three colors. The second horse gear set that I would like to share is also at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, their permanent collection. Um, this one uh, received the 50th anniversary ribbon in 2008 at the Herb Museum in the market, and I titled it Turquoise Horse. It has a, a woven saddle blanket, it has a woven horse bridle that I was telling you about, and then it also has a woven cinch and a felted saddle pad. So let's go on to the, it goes to Facebook as well. the birds. So this one is the large diamond twill pattern. And then you know about the story of how the imprint of the arrowhead is underneath the the, um, the hoof of the horse. And that's why I included the arrowhead as well. There's the felted um, saddle pad. And there's the woven cinch. With again, the Milky Way representation in the middle. And here's the woven bridle. So each strap I wove individually. These two, and then here, and then where it goes around, another one that goes around here. And then this here was braided. And then I found a bit, bought a bit, and then I wove it all onto there. And that's how this piece was assembled. Go ahead. There's another close up. Here's the set. There's the ribbon flying in the wind. So I'm really happy where it's it's it, where it's at because that's also kind of your goal is so that you preserve your art in in those ways. And then the third set, which earlier I talked about, were the Milky Way horse cinch came into picture is with this piece. It's also at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, their permanent collection. And then after that, I titled it The Northern Lights. Um, I didn't enter it into any other um, uh, shows, so it, didn't, it doesn't have a ribbon, except for the, the cinch. So that one has a woven saddle blanket, and has a woven horse cinch, um, and then the everyday strung cinch and the lead rope. So go ahead. That one goes to there as well.
The inspiration of this piece is about the story of the hummingbird. And the hummingbird, how they acquired their, their iridescent and the colors of their feathers and how they brought the northern lights back from the north and also colors of mixed corn. <coughs> and also the story of how you capture a, 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 a hummingbird and you dust it off with pollen or cornmeal and that's what you apply to your horse so that it can be also as quick and as fast as a hummingbird. So here's the set, the man's kind of in the way, that is the set, the woven saddle, the scent, I mean the lead rope, that Milky Way cinch is there, and then the everyday strong um, cinch as well. You go ahead, here's just a close up. This is also my first time using iridescent fiber, which I thought was cool after I was done. Um, they just closed up with the everyday cinch. The strung, and then, it's okay, keep going. Just some close up. This is before I refine my now hummingbirds that you see me. This is just really out of I was still getting, you know, the hang of it. Young me, I don't know how young I was, but that's good. So that's the, the third set. After that, it kind of phased for me. I went on to my next inspirations which were pictorials. Next frame. And then this one are just examples of some of the other cinches that I've woven. Just to give you an example of the different ways that you can weave cinches. I've also woven some breast collars for the horses. Or breasts, what do you call them? Not collars, but they might be in there. So even just the simple stripe patterns makes a wonderful uh, cinch. It doesn't always have to be. Uh, I do a lot of consignment or special custom order pieces of cinches like this one here. That some of you learned the technique this year, this, uh, this morning with me. This one here is uh, an old collection over in Suitland, Maryland. And I think they only have these two pieces there. It's very rare for museums um, collection to have uh, horse implements, especially woven um, cinches. And I think the most um, that the museum has is the Museum of Men in San Diego, which have about 12 or 13 pieces. And other pieces only have one or have none. But Suitland, Maryland has two in the, the American Indian uh, Museum. So I was really happy to see this, uh, the many times I went there to visit. Here's something you're doing, that one particular piece. Earlier on, do you see how before this, the rings, they were just woven this way, and then they were actually just um, sewn onto the rings before they learned how to um, string it onto the D-rings. So they're just woven like so, and then it was just sewn on with the fringes. Go ahead. Doing a lot of re-spinning for some of their really um, strong um, actual um, pieces that people wanted use um, some pieces that are just hung on the wall as an art echo um, but there are some that request me to do the actual with the strength so I usually ply my my warp strings and, and ply some of my um, <coughs> to get it there 
with my handy dandy Louette spinning wheel. And I'm um, setting the twists. If you're a spinner, you know what that means. This is on the mountain, by the way, where I have my sheep camp every summer. And then later you'll see examples of some of the other um, pieces. This one's just the setup. I was telling you about that before where I do the Helps with spacing and then also um, wear. And there's that one that I set up. Back then I used to do two or three at a time. Now I'm like a missile one one a year. Getting ready to sew in my signature mark. Yoda. Some finishing touches, and I think this one I'm re spinning for the lead row. Yep. That's when those got made. So you'll see some of the examples again. Oftentimes people say, I like this design, this is what, the colors that I want. That's the one that has the, the, the breast collar or whatever. That's it. So other exhibits that I've done, uh, weaving in the margins with the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in 2000. It was the first ever uh, exhibition of male weavers. And it, it consisted of uh, an 11 year old and, and a 70 year old. And I think that's what sparked the next exhibit that took place in 2004, Men Who Weave at the Navajo Nation Museum. And that one I was privileged to co-curate it with Clarinda Begay. And then I did my solo exhibit um, titled Nash J. Bekant Begin. And that was a solo exhibit that I did that was, uh, I also co-curated with uh, Teresa. Um, <coughs> sorry. At the Denver uh, University Museum of Anthropology in 2010. And just to accompany what we're doing today, um, I was a co-contributor to this book that you see here. Uh, several of us, I wasn't the only one, um, in, in having little interviews and talking about some of the older pieces of horse implements and, and saddle blankets. Any questions? Nada, no questions. I got the video too. Okay, good. It's on the SD card. Well, thank you guys for your attention. And thank you for inviting us here, and I hope we've shared some of the things that you may or may not have known.